Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Tracy, the pap test. You've heard of that. Probably had a few in your day. I sure have. And that was developed by a Greek physician by the name of George Papanikolaou. Now, you know, my wife is Greek, and she's going to really like me for this. (laughs) So it came into use around the 1940s, but actually he had discovered that you could find malignant cells under the microscope, actually in the 20s or early 30s, but nobody, he never got credit for it. Nobody believed him until around the 1940s when it finally came into use. And, of course, that test is called the pap test or the pap smear and is now used worldwide for the detection and the prevention of cancer of the cervix and other diseases of the female reproductive tract. What he did, or what he showed, was that by gathering just a few cells from the vagina, inside the vagina, the vaginal tract, and looking at them under the microscope, you could actually tell whether or not a woman had cancer of the cervix. Pretty amazing. A huge breakthrough. Absolutely. The pap test changed the lives of millions of women, and now researchers are working on a screening test for endometrial cancer, also known as uterine cancer. Research funded by the National Cancer Institute and Mayo Clinic is developing a screening method using DNA from a tampon for early detection and screening of endometrial cancers. Now, how unique is that DNA from a tampon? Wow. So, and, it, and we're talking about uterine cancer as opposed to cervical cancer, and the two are connected, but the cervix is just the, the opening of the, of the uterus. With baby boomers now in the age risk category for endometrial cancer, the number of women diagnosed each year is increasing. Here to discuss this new minimally invasive screening method for endometrial cancer is the woman leading the research, Dr. Jamie Bacham Gomez. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Bacham Gomez. Thank you. Dr. Bacham Gomez, pretty exciting stuff and truly unique. Tell us about this using a tampon to diagnose endometrial or uterine cancer. Absolutely. Um, we're very excited about this. We've known for decades that abnormal cells from inside the uterus can be picked on, picked up on pap smears, but it's not very um, commonly picked up that way. There are other markers that are not that are naked, uh, that are not necessarily visible under the microscope, such as molecular markers that we can actually now test for. These are changes in DNA, so DNA mutations, um, DNA methylation, which is where the gene is actually turned off because of a, a change uh, to what's kind of hanging on to the DNA called methyl groups. Um, and we can pick those, uh, those changes up, not only in the actual cells that are the cancer cells, uh, but when those cancer cells shed and flow down through the cervix into the vagina, they can be picked up, um, those, those signals can be picked up on pap smear. And we're actually taking it to the next level of um, trying to pick them up on the fluid that is in the vaginal uh, canal. Because it's in that fluid. It's in that fluid. And, um, and the reason that we're focusing on detecting this using a tampon is that a tampon is a common hygiene product that most women use. Um, in fact, um, the tampon business in the United States um, in 2015, $1.5 billion. So we mm-hmm. know, using, using that as a surrogate, that this is a very common and well-accepted collection prod, so uh, collection device. It's not a special tampon by any means? It's the kind you just buy at the convenience store? Well, what we're doing from, from the research standpoint, uh, we're just using the common over-the-counter mm-hmm. regular tampon. Mm-hmm. Um, as we develop this test further, it'll likely be something a little bit more specialized. So tell us how this works. Uh, you, you tell the woman uh, to use a tampon, put a tampon in, and then take it out when and then bring it to you? Is that uh, How does it work? So right now we have a clinical trial open um, in which we are collecting uh, tampon samples from women who are coming in with abnormal uterine bleeding uh, that are perimenopausal or postmenopausal. So it's still in the research phases. Um, And before they have a biopsy to determine whether or not there is or what the cause of that abnormal bleeding is, um, we're asking them to collect a tampon. Um, They're doing that in the clinic. Uh, We time how long it's been in the vagina because that's also part of the test. We need to figure out exactly how long it uh, it needs to be in the vagina? What's the minimum amount of time? Mm-hmm. Um, and then the then the uh, woman goes on to have her clinically indicated biopsy. And how is it doing so far? Uh, well, so far we've enrolled almost a thousand patients to that to this clinical trial. 
Um, and uh, we are working on the combination of markers, DNA methylation mutation uh, markers, uh, to be able to test in prospectively in those in those uh, samples. Well, this sounds what sounds somewhat similar to Cologuard, where you take a stool specimen and look for abnormal DM DNA that will tell you whether or not the patient has uh, colon cancer. S same principle. Absolutely. So Cologuard is a combination of mutations, um, er, one mutation and uh, three methylated genes, and they're all, they also look for fecal occult hemoglobin. So it's, it's much... Fecal um, occult hemoglobin. <laughs> fecal <laughs> Those are doctor words. <laughs> <laughs> yep, exactly. So fecal occult hemoglobin, they're looking for blood as well. So, But it's a multi-target uh, DNA test um, that is self-collected. And exactly, that's exactly what we're trying to, um, to do with this type of a test, um, is develop something that is highly patient accepted, something that provides women um, with high access, meaning they could collect the sample at home and potentially mail it in. That's our ultimate view, or ultimate vision, I should say. That would make, I would imagine, make a big difference for anybody could take part in that. I mean, it could be that someone notices that they're not feeling right or they've got some symptoms, but they don't end up going to see a physician. This would be a good step to get that ball rolling. Absolutely. We know that uh, decreased access to health care um, does worsen survival in certain cancers. So that is that is something that we are um, hoping that ultimately we impact. So pretty soon you may be able to just send in a sample from every orifice and you don't even have to go see your doctor and you find out if you've got cancer anywhere in your body. Pretty, pretty amazing. So uh, uterine cancer itself, what, um, what are the symptoms? Who's, who's at risk for this particular problem? Yeah, so there are very well-known risk factors for uterine cancer. Obesity is probably one of the largest risk factors for ovarian or for endometrial cancer. Um, also, uh, having diabetes, hypertension, uh, those are also, and hyperlipidemia, those are risk factors. Having a family history of uterine cancer, colon cancer, stomach cancer, um, those symptoms or those uh, cancers tend to uh, if you, there are families where you can actually see high numbers of those cancers and that's considered Lynch syndrome or some families are mm. diagnosed with Lynch syndrome, which is a genetic condition that puts, um, women at higher risk for uterine cancer. You don't hear about very many women dying of uterine cancer. I know it happens, but it must not, it, it is not all that common. So it must be very treatable if you can just make the diagnosis. Right. It is, uh, it is fairly treatable, especially in early stages, um, early stages, Typically, the treatment is surgery alone. Um, even in advanced stages, uh, there are potential cures, but usually it requires extensive surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. And the side effects of those are oftentimes long-lasting. And what are some of the symptoms of endometrial cancer? Yeah, so symptoms, 90% of women with endometrial cancer will present with some sort of abnormal bleeding, or abnormal vaginal bleeding. Um, Postmenopausal women... Uh, uh, about uh, even though 90% of women with a cancer will present with abnormal vaginal bleeding, only 10% of women who come in with postmenopausal bleeding will actually have a cancer. Well, that's a good thing. It is a good thing. It <laughs> is. But also, all of those women undergo an endometrial biopsy, which is an invasive procedure. And we're looking to try to help avoid that as well. Wow. It's uh, it's just as interesting, just as exciting, just as incredible as Cologuard. So mm -hmm. uh, we wish you all the success in the world. We've been talking about uh, endometrial cancer screening with Dr. Jamie Bacham Gamez. We'll take a short break, but when we come back, you know, September is Gynecologic Cancer Awareness Month. We'll discuss some of the other common gynecological cancers, including the deadliest of them all, ovarian cancer. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Well, we've been talking about endometrial cancer screening and a new method to do that using a tampon with Dr. Jamie Bacham Gamez. But now we'll expand our discussion to other reproductive system cancers because September is Gynecologic Cancer Awareness Month. So, Dr. Bacham Gamez, why, uh, why is ovarian cancer the, the worst of all of these? So ovarian cancer has um, kind of a long uh, standing nickname, and that is that it's a silent killer. Um, the signs and symptoms of ovarian cancer can be very vague, despite the fact that it's already in its advanced stages. The signs and symptoms of ovarian cancer typically fall into four categories or four, um, four symptoms, and that is abdominal bloating or distension, 
uh, change in appetite or satiety, basically getting full fast when you eat. Um, bowel changes, um, whether it's swinging to constipation or diarrhea, um, and then bladder changes, uh, frequency or uh, frequency of urination uh, or urgency. So let's go over those once more. Bloating. Uh, just want to make sure that that all of our listeners have these. Mm-hmm. Bloating is one, but the, the problem with that, of course, is that uh, everybody has that at one time or another, mm-hmm. and you sort of write it off and. So it may it's be a constant, long time. Yeah. Yes. all day, all the time. Yeah, we're talking about something that's constant, that's persistent for you know probably more like two weeks or so, rather than an intermittent uh, type of process. Um, but you're right; that's why these signs, these these symptoms are quite vague. All right, and then you had bowel changes, mm-hmm. uh, bladder problems, and, th- and number two uh, had to do with eating satiety, yeah, early satiety. Yeah, so feeling full fast, yeah. So is ovarian cancer, in a sense, somewhat like cancer of the pancreas in that because the, the organ, in this case the, the ovaries, are so deep-seated that it they have to get fairly, the tumor has to get fairly large before it does cause any symptoms, and by that time it has often metastasized or spread elsewhere? Yeah, there are different patterns uh, as far as the spread of ovarian cancer, but most often uh, the GI type of symptoms, the bowel changes, and even the early uh, feeling full early in a meal um, are probably related to the metastatic deposits that are on the surface of the small intestine, um, large intestine, and sometimes even the stomach. So what's this five-year survival rate now for uh, women with ovarian cancer? And compare that to, let's say, a decade ago. Are we better? We're better. Yeah, we've definitely made uh, a lot of progress. Um, I think it's it's hard sometimes to go through to actually dissect out what the five-year survival is for ovarian cancer in general because most ovarian cancers are diagnosed at an advanced stage. Um, one of the most important prognostic aspects is thorough surgery uh, in the beginning of the diagnosis before starting If you starting can get it all out, good. If you can get it all out, that actually improves five-year survival. Um, and some studies have actually shown that at five years, um, more than 50% of women are still alive who were diagnosed with advanced stage disease. Where does it usually go to from the ovary? It starts there, but then where does it spread? Um, it likes to go to an organ that's inside the abdomen called the omentum. Uh, it is an organ that hangs down off of the stomach and large intestine. Mm. That's a, a favorite place for it to go. But it t- typically respects tissue planes and likes to sit on the other organs within the abdomen, like the small intestine and large intestine. Mm. So it's surgery if you can. Mm-hmm. Uh, if it's amenable to surgery, hasn't spread too, far, too many places or too far away from the ovaries. Um, chemotherapy. And what about radiation? Is it ever part of the regimen? Radiation used to be part of the regimen for ovarian cancer, but it has uh, it has fallen out of favor because we've shown that chemotherapy is actually more effective. So treatment for ovarian cancer is a combination of surgery and chemotherapy. Sometimes we give chemotherapy first and then surgery in between um, two courses of chemotherapy. And what's the average age of the woman diagnosed with ovarian cancer? So most often the woman that's diagnosed with ovarian cancer is going to be in her early 60s. Yeah, mm-hmm. so pretty young. It is, yes. September being Gynecologic Cancer Awareness Month. We've talked about endometrial cancer and ovarian cancer. Um, What's up next? Cervical? Well, cervical cancer is uh, also one of our specialties. Mm -hmm. And uh, how, how important or how deadly is cervical cancer? So cervical cancer, actually, the mortality in in the United States as well as in um, other developed nations has dramatically decreased with the introduction of the pap smear um, back in the 1940s. Uh, We also now have the vaccine against the human papillomavirus, which causes most of uh, most cervical cancers. Um, that vaccine, or those vaccines, I should say, because there's actually a series of them um, that are potent- that are available. Um, those vaccines, we don't think we've seen the impact of them yet, um, because those are vaccines that are currently indicated for um, for young women, um, ages 11 and 12. And men, too. And men, too. Yep, exactly. So you think if enough people, enough of young people get vaccinated, we can pretty much wipe out cervical cancer? What what percentage of cervical cancers are caused by this virus, HPV? So um, almost all of them are caused by a high-risk type of virus. 70% are caused by two specific viruses, HPV-16 and HPV-18. And the vaccine good against both of those? It is, yep. All three vaccines that are available um, are include HPV 16 and 18. Well, it's hard to believe, but women can also get cancer of the vagina. Mm -hmm. How often do you see that? 
So vaginal cancer is much more rare than, than cervical cancer, but it is also most often caused by those same viruses, the HPV viruses. Hmm. And so uh, that's the key of that HPV. It's, it really is a cancer vaccine. I think people try to diminish it a little bit, saying, oh, it's a sexually transmitted disease mm -hmm. thing, but it's, it really is a cancer vaccine. Yes, it is. Um, all three of the vaccines that are available are against, um, they include HPV 16, 18, uh, as well as the new nine valent vaccine includes other high risk types of virus as well. So does a pap smear, you use a pap smear for endometrial, cervical, vaginal, vaginal and vulvar? Is that for pap smears too? So pap smears are really only designed for cervical cancer okay. uh, detection. Um, it's very rare that we pick up an endometrial cancer on a pap smear. Okay. But if uterine cancer, yep. Right. Okay. Endometrial. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. A uterine cancer. Um, but if we see abnormal glandular cells on a pap smear, that should mm. prompt a biopsy of the of the endometrium or the lining of the uterus. So tell us a little bit more about uh, cancer of the va vagina. How do you treat that? Most of the time, cancer of the vagina is treated with a combination of radiation and chemotherapy. And the chemotherapy is given in a low dose to sensitize the cancer to the radiation. Hmm. So they work synergistically. They kind of yes. work together. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to remove the vagina. Not unless uh, we, we typically try not to l remove the vagina because it's very close to other vital structures, such as the bladder and the rectum. So most often, uh, even stage one vaginal cancers are usually treated with a combination of chemotherapy and radiation. And usually works? Ha very high success rate, yes. And how about uh, what's the average age of a woman who presents with vaginal cancer? Women with vaginal cancer tend to be a little bit more, a little bit uh, on the older side than those with cervical cancer. Women with cervical cancer are typically in their 30s or 40s. Uh, vaginal cancer, somewhere around 60 or 70. And symptoms, bleeding or pain with intercourse or both? or Actually both, yeah. So bleeding is probably the most common sign uh, or symptom, but definitely pain with intercourse or even pain uh, with if the tumor is large enough, it can cause pain just by being present. All right, and one more we want to talk about, cancer of the vulva, mm -hmm. and that's got to be pretty rare. Tell us about that. It is very rare, um, and it's a skin cancer. Um, cancer of the vulva can usually, can also be caused by human papillomavirus. Um, we typically see uh, kind of a bimodal distribution of vulvar cancer, which means we see it in a younger population of women, and that's usually associated with HPV um, infection. And then there's an older uh, population of women that can develop uh, vulvar cancer. And those women are typically in their 80s or 90s. Um, and that's usually associated with having some sort of dermatologic condition like lichen sclerosis, which is not a cancer itself, but can cause uh, symptoms such as itching. All right, do we have time to ask her about the CDC mm -hmm. Inside Knowledge Campaign? We do. <laughs> Tell us about it. Do you know anything about the CDC Inside Knowledge Campaign? I do not. I think we're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> well, finally, I've, I've got a question. Um, when we're talking about the gynecologic cancers, how uh, we mentioned premenopausal or postmenopausal, what does estrogen, what role does it play in any of or, or all of those? That's a great question. So um, in uterine cancer, um, some women, uh, well, with uterine cancer, some of the risk factors for developing it, obesity, diabetes, actually are associated with a higher level of unopposed estrogen in the body. Um, and that is actually what leads most often to the development of, a uter of an endometrial uterine cancer. Um, estrogen itself does not play a role when it comes to the development of cervical cancer, vaginal cancer, vulvar cancer. Um, in those that are associated with HPV, such as cervical and vaginal cancer, um, oftentimes smoking is one of the mm -hmm. uh, risk factors that helps the, the virus get incorporated and start turning on those cancer, the cancer machine, machinery genes. Um, and then re regarding ovarian cancer, there, there does not appear to be um, a link between um, estrogen and the development of ovarian cancer. In fact, birth control pills reduce the risk of ovarian cancer. Well, yeah, there you go. September is Gynecologic Cancer Awareness Month. We've been updated by a true expert from the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Bakum Gamez. Thanks so much for being with us. Really appreciate your time. Thank you.